So I briefly talked about vectors before, but I didn't record any of that, so we're just going to redo that vector lesson really quickly. <clears throat> so we're going to start with uh, vector operations. So let's do with some notation first. So remember points. So back in the good old days, they were either two dimensions or three dimensions. But of course, you can have four dimensional point. But you can't use x, y, z anymore because you're going to run out of letters. So if it's more than three dimensions, you just use subscripts. So that would be an n dimensional point right there. So that's how we draw point or write points down. And now for vectors, two dimensions, it looks really similar. The only difference is I'm using these diamond brackets, three dimensions, and n dimensions. So that's diamond notation. You can also write them vertical. And again, the advantage when you write them vertically is you don't have commas anymore. So you don't have to worry about the commas. And anytime you're going to write subscripts and commas, you're going to pretty much have problems in terms of distinguishing what's a comma, what's a period, what's a subscript, etc. I am frequently going to use the vertical notation. <clears throat> so that's how we write vectors. So a vector is the oriented line segment. from the origin to whatever the endpoint is specified. So if we go to graph a vector, let's go ahead and graph, let's do 3, negative 2. So we're going to go over 3 to the right, 2 down. So normally we'd be graphing a point like that. That's the point 3, 2, or 3, negative 2, but we're doing vectors. So we have the line segment. So that would be the line segment. Oriented means there's a direction. It's a one way street. So you put an arrow generally. We draw the arrow at the end of it. You don't have to. You can draw the arrow in the middle like that. It just depends on what's happening. So usually we're going to draw the arrowhead at the end. So that's what it looks like. Now we're going to have a vocabulary word called a vector space. Now a vector space is the space where the vectors live. Or the set of all vectors. of a given dimension. Notation. Now your book talks a lot about complex numbers. So if we keep it real, you could write it as R2, which of course is R times R. And R2 it's a cool robot in Star Wars, but it's also the 
Cartesian plane. So you got one axis, one real axis, and another real axis, and any point or any vector here is going to have two coordinates. So we just pick some vector, it's going to have two coordinates, an x and a y. So any vector v inside of R2 has two coordinates. So v will equal, we'll just call it xy. Now if you take the set of all the two-dimensional vectors over all, you'll get one vector for each point in the plane. And uh, if you think about them as points, the entire set of all of them is just the plane itself. So the way we just write uh, two-dimensional vectors, the set of two-dimensional vectors will be R2. The set of two-dimensional vectors R3, the set of 3D vectors, and I could write R4, but we'll just go right over to Rn, the set of N dimensional vectors. Now the book talks about complex numbers quite a bit, you can have a vector that has complex entries. So normally the uh, vectors have real, or at least all the vectors I've shown so far have uh, entries that are real numbers, but you could have entries that are complex numbers. have complex entries instead of real entries, in which case you would have C2, C3, and of course Cn, and that would be the set of two-dimensional complex vectors. So what's the difference between complex vectors and real vectors? The only difference really is how you multiply the two entries together. So I multiply complex numbers carefully, but in a somewhat similar way to how we multiply real numbers. So you just have to worry about your i squared is negative one. Technically you can go beyond complex numbers. I believe anything that is a field can be used for your entries. I don't want to describe what a field is because that takes a few weeks of abstract algebra. So I would just say, for us, we'll mostly keep it real. Occasionally you're gonna see some complex problems. And I'm not gonna do a review of how to multiply complex numbers. You should have remembered that from pre-calculus class. If not, you can um, look it up or ask in the tutor center. So we'll mostly be keeping it real though. The other word for these uh, real spaces, these are all called Euclidean. So it'll just be Euclidean 2 space, Euclidean 3 space, or Euclidean n space. Uh, named after Euclid, one of the first geometers, and probably the most famous. So we have already talked about what does it mean for vectors to be equal, to add them, and to scale or multiply them. So we'll just cover that again really quickly. 
So these will all be covered over vector operations. So we'll do equality first. Now I'll do it in n dimensions. So we're going to have vector v and u inside Rn, so n dimensional space. So vector v, there's going to be n elements, so it'll be v1, v2 to vn. And if that equals u, which is similar, but u1, u2 down to un. So if you know that two vectors are equal, well, first of all, they better have the same size. How in the world can a two-dimensional vector be equal to a three-dimensional vector? That doesn't make any sense, so you need them to be the same size. What can you say about the actual entries themselves? So if the vectors have the same size for both n dimensions, what does it take to make two vectors equal? So two vectors are equal, they have to be the same arrow, meaning pointing the same direction. So they both have to go the same amount in the first coordinate, the same amount in the second coordinate, the same amount in the third coordinate. So vectors are equal when all coordinate values are equal. So in this case, we need n coordinate values to be equal. So that is equality. Now we'll look at addition. So u and v inside Rn. Again, uh, the size must match. do is add a u and v so v is going to have again n dimensions u has the same number of dimensions and the way we add them is one dimension at a time So it's a good time to make sure your u does not look like your v. So when I write my u, my, I use a different font for math versus writing uh, words. For example, when I write words, we'll look at the word value. One of those is a u, one's a v. You can only tell because you know how to spell the word value, not because they look different. So that's my font when I write. I don't know which one's a u and a v. but when I write math, that's pretty important. So my u's have a foot. Other than that, I can't really tell them apart. So make sure that whatever font you use to write your math, your letters don't look the same. Also, your T doesn't look like a plus, things like this. So I switch fonts when I write math a little bit than when I write, I'm writing in English. All right, so that's how we add. You can also add visually, so addition is done graphically head to tail. So if we had uh, vector two vectors, u and v. So I'll switch to the blue. So I want to go u plus v. So there's two ways to do it. One way is to go first u and then second v. So what I did is I took a copy of v and I just moved the arrow over. So you don't want to rotate, you want to just translate. So we're just basically dragging it. It should point the same direction, same length. So that vector right here, I'll draw in green. That green vector is u plus v.
There's another way to go head to tail. You could do the vector V first and then, so I'm going to cross that V at the bottom and then I'm going to bring a copy of U but start it where V ends right there. So what that means is you can add either order. So addition is commutative. So addition is commutative. You do it just one coordinate at a time. And of course, if you look at the top, we'll just look at the first row right here. If you have two numbers, real numbers, doesn't matter the order you add them. Do you get a different result? If you just add two numbers, you can add them either order. So. Uh, on the top of the board doesn't matter what order they're in and also if you look at the picture it doesn't matter the order there so addition is commutative and last operation we're going to look at is scalar multiplication so scalar means number We're going to use Greek letters. So alpha, beta are going to be really common scalars. Gamma, if you need a third. When we're using real numbers, which we are going to use quite a bit. So when our entries are real, our scalars are real. So if we are using real vectors, our scalar is going to be a real number. If we're using complex number, our scalar is going to be complex. So again, either it's going to be a real number or a complex number. It just depends on how your vector is. And the way we do scalar multiplication, so we're going to need a vector as well. So our vector is going to be n-dimensional. So alpha v, that's alpha times the vector v, so v1, v2, down to vn. And all you do is distribute your alpha inside to each coordinate. So that's what scalar multiplication looks like. Let's do an example. So let's find and simplify. Is this problem real or complex? Complex. So as soon as I see eyes, it's going to be complex. The most important thing to remember with complex numbers, i squared is negative 1. If you can keep that straight and you don't forget your algebra rules, you can pretty much recover everything else off of that. All right, what operation am I going to be performing here? Addition or multiplication? multiplication? Multiplication. So a scalar multiplication. If we look, I have a complex scalar and a complex vector. So how do I do this? We could write it vertically. So that's a number. And then written vertically, our vector is i in the first entry, negative 1 plus 2i in the second entry. How we multiply is we basically distribute to each entry. 3 minus i times i, and the second will be 3 minus i times negative 1 plus 2i. All right, distribute these and simplify them. So the second one you're going to be foiling, and just remember i squared is negative 1. So I'll give you a minute to figure these out.
So you should have 1 plus 3i and negative 1 plus 7i. You can absolutely FOIL. Uh, usually I like to FLOI because that will put your real terms first. You'll have your, uh, so for example, my second term, I like that to be real. So I'm just, I have my real stuff at the beginning and my complex stuff afterwards. So I just do first, last, and then outside, inside. The outside, inside are the parts that stay complex. On your quizzes, I will try to keep your quizzes and midterms all real numbers if I can. So I'll minimize the number of complex uh, numbers on your... I don't think you want to do row operations with complex numbers, for example. I just have a suspicion. You probably want to do real number row operations, not a whole bunch of complex arithmetic, especially if you did complex with fractions. It's probably the worst. So I will try to keep... There definitely will be some homework problems that have complex. Um, entries in them. And occasionally I'll do some examples in class of complex numbers. Especially on this problem, it would be too easy if I just did real numbers. It would be like no thinking. <coughs> so we talked about addition, scale, and multiplication. So we're going to look more carefully uh, about the vector space and some properties. So our vector space again is either Rn or Cn. So we get what's called closure. Any U and V inside, I'm just gonna go with Rn. It's true for Cn as well. <coughs> so if I take two n-dimensional vectors, if I add the two vectors together, how many dimensions will my vector have? We can run back up and look at addition. So I have two n-dimensional vectors. How many dimensions will my sum have? Well, so if I have n dimensions, so my two vectors come from Rn, so they each have n dimensions. If I add those two vectors together, I do get one vector with the same number with n dimensions. So my dimension doesn't change. So this is the properties we call closure. So if I write it down, more algebraically, any u and v in Rn, u plus v is still inside of Rn. 
So if I add two vectors and in n dimensions, my sum is a vector in n dimensions. So I don't get a vector in n plus one dimensions or a vector in two n dimensions. Same number of dimensions. So that's additive closure. Uh, there'll be scalar closure. So that's any vector v in r n and any scalar, so alpha in r, then alpha v will be inside r n. So if I take any vector and multiply it by any real number, it'll still be an n-dimensional vector. It won't change the dimensions. It will, unless that number is one, it'll change the vector. We'll get a different vector, but it won't change where it lives or where it comes from. So that's scalar closure, commutativity. So this is additive, commutativity. two vectors in Rn, u plus v is equal to v plus u. So additive associativity. Now I need three vectors, u, v, and w in Rn u plus v, do that first, and then add w. That's the same as u plus the sum of v and w. So I can move parentheses. Whenever you're allowed to move parentheses, what that really means is I don't need parentheses. So that allows you to be lazy and write u plus v plus w. So addition is a binary operation, meaning you can only add two things, but the result is another number, in this case another vector, I can then add another thing to that. So we act like we can add three numbers together because what we really do is add two numbers and then we add the third number. If we think we're really smart, we add them really quickly and pretend like we did it all at the same time. I mean, if you just do one plus one plus one, we know it's three, even though your brain kind of skipped two, you probably still in some way counted up to three. At some point, your brain stopped it too, even though you probably didn't realize it. Uh, especially if I'm going to put way bigger numbers in here, like 37 plus 45 plus 193. I'm pretty sure you're going to add two of those before you add the third one in. Uh, even though we might pretend that if we do it quickly, we added all three simultaneously. You probably didn't. And same is true for vectors. All right, so order doesn't matter when you add. Uh, we'll do the zero properties at the end. So let's do a scalar associativity. So here we're going to have a single vector, so any v in Rn. We need two scalars now. Alpha and beta are going to be real. So you could do alpha beta v is the same as alpha times beta v. And, oh, there's no other way to associate. Oh, I totally skipped scalar commutativity. Let's squeeze that in where it should have gone. Oh, I'll do something that'll make you mad. I'll squeeze it in that space right there that I just created. You can just write it at the bottom and just keep going. I just want it to be in order. So I want two scalars now and one vector. So we have an n-dimensional vector, alpha, beta are scalars. And what we get is 
alpha times beta v is the same as beta times alpha v. So you can change the order. That's true uh, with regular scalars. It's also true with scalar multiplication. So we took care of all of our associativity, commutativity. Now we'll look at, we'll do our distributed distributivity at the end. We'll do the uh, the zeros, or the identities and the inverses now. So additive identity. So any vector v in Rn So if I'm going to add a vector to V, I need my vector to be n dimensions. So I'm going to take my zero to be in Rn. So in this case, zero, the zero vector is the vector with n zeros right here. So if we think about adding any vector to the zero vector, all the coordinates are zero. So as you go add one coordinate at a time, you're just adding zero to each coordinate, so that won't change your coordinates. And you're going to get the exact same vector you started with. So that zero vector acts additively like the number zero. You can add that zero vector and not change anything. That's what we call the additive identity. And of course, you could add the other order. So it's the same as zero plus V. Here's our scalar identity. Any vector v and rn. What number when you multiply doesn't change things? So our number one, it's a little silly, but I'm gonna write one lives in r. I mean, we knew that already, but I'm just gonna write that so it matches all of our other uh, properties above, just saying where one comes from, it comes from the set of numbers. So if we have one V, that's just V. You're going to multiply every entry, every coordinate by one. So you get the same thing. And of course we can multiply it on either side. We could write as one times V or V times one. And now we are into, let's see, oh, we got inverse. any n-dimensional vector, negative 1 times v is the additive inverse. So what that means is if I add this vector to v, they're going to cancel or invert each other, and I should get out not the vector nothing, but the vector 0. So if I do v plus negative 1 v, there is no such thing as subtraction, but if you insist, you can write it as v minus v, but we really mean v plus the opposite vector, or the negative vector. And when we add those two together, if you just think what's happening coordinate by coordinate, what we're really looking at is v1, v2, vn, plus negative one times v1, v2, vn. They're each gonna cancel out to zero. which we call the zero vector, of course. So we can write it as v plus negative v equals the zero vector. So that's the additive inverse, how to undo a vector. And now there's two types of distributive uh, rules. So distributivity, the best way to describe that is how addition and multiplication work together, or how they interact. So 
sequence or how they play together. So we're going to need some scalars and some vectors. So we'll go alpha, beta as our scalars. And we'll keep the same letters for our vectors. U and V are going to be n-dimensional vectors. There's two ways you can distribute. Alpha plus beta, that whole number, times the vector V. And you can probably see how this is going to distribute. You're going to get alpha V plus beta V. So that shouldn't be surprising. You're just distributing the multiplication across addition. In this case, if you draw distribution arrows, you're really kind of distributing from the right side the way I drew it out like this. So you're really distributing kind of from the right side. The other way you can have distribution, if you have one scalar and then the sum of two vectors, this distribution, it feels similar, but it's a little bit different because you have two vectors and one scalar instead of the other way around. So again, there's two types of distributing. So that takes care of intro to vectors. And now we're going to look at linear combinations. So any questions before we move on to the next section? So I see two words. The first one's linear. I talked about linear. What, what, what's a way to describe linear? What's that? So everything is that all of our variables are just first powers. Nothing squared. We're not dividing by any variables. So linear. So all variables have only first powers. So they were allowed to be added together. We're allowed to add, you know, x1 plus x2. That's a linear, uh, a proper linear sum. What else can I do aside from adding variables together? What other operations allowed? I can't square, can't take square roots, can't really change any powers. There was two operations we just looked at 10 minutes ago. One of them was addition. What was the other one? So we had addition, and what was the other one? Multiplication. What type? Scalar. So multiplying by a constant or by a number. So that's another uh, linear, uh, another operation you can do and still have linear. Have only first powers and can be multiplied by constants or by scalars. So linear combination is basically all combinations of adding variables and multiplying each of them by scalars. You can be lazy and write lin combo. So linear combination. So it's the sum of variables multiplied by scalars. So linear combination of, we'll go just do uh, x1, x2, and x3 is alpha1, x1, 
Actually, let's do vectors instead of, I don't know why I'm doing numbers. So we'll go V1, V2, V3. Alpha 1, V1, plus alpha 2, V2, plus alpha 3, V3. So that would be a linear combination of these three vectors. So again, the operations we're using are scalar multiplication and addition. So those are the two operations we have. So that would be a linear combination. So let's do one fast example. So let's do V1 is 3, 0, 1. V2 will be 2, 1, negative 1. And let's find 3, V1 minus 4, V2. So find that linear combination right now. Uh oh, I'm subtracting. So you're really just adding negative 4 v2. So however you like to think about it. Alright, so find that vector. You should have one vector. How many dimensions should the vector have? Better have three dimensions. So don't gain or lose dimensions. If you change dimensions, something most likely went wrong. So you should start with the same dimensions you finish with, or something weird's happening. So we're going to look at rewriting a linear system. And let's write an actual, very specific linear system. Let's do x1 minus x2 plus 2x3 equals 1. Second equation, 2x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals 8, and third, x1 plus x2 equals 5. <coughs> so what I'm going to do, instead of writing a matrix, what I'm going to do is rewrite this as a linear combination of vectors. So I'm taking my x1s and basically separating them out. So now it's x1 times the vector 1, 2, 1. Now if I multiply that out, I have x1, and then the second will be 2x1, and the third will be x1. So that exactly corresponds to what's above. So I'm breaking this down in a slightly different way. Next up, we're going to go plus x2 times negative 1, 1, 1. Next up, x3 times the vector 2, 1, 
There are no X3s, so if I basically force an X3 in there, there's going to be no X3s or zero X3s. So I have two, one, zero. And then the right side of the equation is the vector 1, 8, 5. So I could do the scalar multiplication and then the addition. And if I do that, I'll have x, x1 minus x2 plus 2x3. That's my first row. My second row is 2x1 plus x2 plus x3. And last row, x1 plus x2. I don't have to go plus any x3s, so that's good enough. And the right side, 1, 8, 5. What you were looking at in this form here is one vector equals another vector. And two vectors are equal when all their entries, all their coordinates match. So there's really three equations. There's the first equation right there, which matches first equation on the board, second equation, second equation, third equation, third equation. So, this is just another way to write a linear system by writing as a linear combination instead. And this way of writing a linear system, we're going to use this when we talk about vector spaces, spanning sets, uh, anytime that we want to describe vectors themselves and combinations of vectors as opposed to a linear system. And the crazy thing is you're describing the exact same thing using different words. You're going to find that basically we're going to tell, I'm going to tell you the exact same thing like 30 different ways this quarter. It just depends on how you think of it. So it's going to all come back to solving linear system, which we did in chapter one.